The $231 million is apparently not the final number. It could be higher than that. We believe we had to take those actions to try to, again, lower costs across the board. Green energy projects cancelled by the Ford government are leaving Ontario taxpayers stuck with the multi-million dollar bill. When the PCs took the reins of power last year, a number of renewable energy projects were scrapped. At the time, taxpayers were promised they wouldn't be on the hook. Now we're learning it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley joins us live now. And Mike, we're learning about this because of some digging by the opposition. Well, Dwight, the government refused to tell the NDP directly about this spending, so the New Democrats had to fish it out using the legislative library here at Queen's Park. And the cost has got them drawing comparisons to the gas plant scandal. Dismantling a wind turbine built only last year. This wind farm in Prince Edward County is being torn down right now to fulfill a Doug Ford election promise. They want to put up thousands of wind turbines without consent. One of Ford's first acts after becoming Premier, scrapping this wind energy project called White Pines. The PCs said it wouldn't cost Ontarians, but it turns out there is a price tag. Throwing away $231 million not to build renewable Order. energy. The NDP uncovered the spending buried in this document that closes the books on the province's financial year. It's listed as simply other transactions, and it's just shy of 231 million bucks. Wasting 231 million dollars to cancel hydro contracts is the sort of thing that the previous Liberal government did during the gas plant scandal. Order. The similarities are striking. The Liberal government of Dalton McGuinty cancelled two gas-fired power plants in Mississauga and Oakville. The Auditor General pegged that cost at more than a billion dollars. Those gas plants were in Liberal ridings. I'll take fair criticism for decisions that were made while we were in government. But I also believe that the government's going down the wrong path with, with uh, energy and electricity. And tearing up these contracts was the absolute wrong thing to do. The unwanted wind farm is in the riding of this PC cabinet minister. This was a project that residents of Prince Edward County had been fighting against uh, since it was proposed. This municipality was an unwilling host from day one. They did not want the, the turbines and we did the right thing. The Ford government is blaming the cost of scrapping wind farms on the Liberals. The PCs say the previous government approved too many green energy projects that would have generated electricity that Ontario doesn't need. For this government to rip up contracts and literally rip wind turbines out of the ground is a huge waste of money. It makes absolutely no sense to me. Now today, the government admitted the final price tag for cancelling that Prince Edward County wind farm is not actually in yet. But the PCs also say that not having to pay for power from those turbines will keep your hydro bills lower down the road. Dwight? Thanks for that, Mike. It could put thousands of rental units on the market in a city that many say has a housing crisis. But just how officials will enforce new rules around short-term rentals is still unclear tonight. Alicia San has been looking into this for us. And Ali, these rules have actually been in the works now for some time. That's right, for about two years now. And the short-term rental landscape in Toronto has been sort of a wild west ever since Airbnb came to town all those years ago. And we knew this day would come, that there would be rules, but just how effective they're going to be is yet to be seen. It's an estimated 5,000 units that, that are out there uh, that could very well be used for uh, long-term rentals. Toronto's rental supply is low, and what is out there is increasingly expensive. The new regulations are supposed to put more viable rental stock on the market. It's part crackdown, part balanced approach. By creating home sharing opportunities, but making sure that housing is being used for the residents of Toronto uh, to, to, to be their homes. Here are some of the big changes. You're only allowed to host short-term rentals in your primary residence. People can rent out their entire home or a max of three bedrooms. And while you're away, an entire home can be rented out as a short-term rental for a maximum of 180 nights a year. People who live in secondary suites can also participate as long as your basement apartment, for example, is your principal residence. While the city sees this as a win, longtime realtor Brendan Powell says... It's not going to jump right back into the rental market. I don't think it's that simple. A lot of those people don't 
they're, they're not going to get the cash flow that they want, or they don't really want to be landlords. So I think they're going to see more stuff on the market to sell, and there's going to be some market back on the market for the rentals for sure, and then there's going to be some people that just pull out completely. I could see people putting those basement apartments in someone else's name. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's always going to be people skirting the rules, and there's going to be enforcement, and that's going to be a little cat and mouse game. Hosts are now going to have to register their properties with the city and pay a fee of 50 bucks. Details around enforcement are still being figured out, but one thing's for sure. We will be enforcing very much on a complaint basis. This will help us to deal with a lot of the issues that we have with the ghost hotels, with the party homes, many of those issues. We're going to have the tools now uh, to enforce that because there, there will be a bylaw uh, that has a program and that home sharing companies will have to be licensed and then will have to abide by the rules. So just when will these new rules take effect? We don't even know that yet. We're expecting more information in December, and this could all be challenged yet again. Trying to regulate the sharing economy, as we have seen before, is not an easy battle. Dwight. Thank you for that, Ali. You got it. Some big changes in store this week in Ottawa. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau unveils his new cabinet tomorrow. Already some of the changes have started to trickle out. Francois-Philippe Champagne will take over from Christian Freeland as the new Minister of Foreign Affairs. It's not clear yet where Freeland will land and former Fisheries Minister Jonathan Wilkinson is being promoted to Environment Minister, formerly held by Catherine McKenna. Now, Star Quebec candidate Stephen Guilbeault will take over as Minister of Canadian Heritage. Current Heritage Minister Pablo Rodriguez will become Government House Leader. CBC has full coverage beginning at 12.30 Eastern. The swearing-in ceremony begins at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. You can also, of course, stream it online. All the changes coming your way on the CBC Gem. Public hearings continue in Washington at the impeachment inquiry of Donald Trump. Three of today's witnesses were on that crucial call with the president of Ukraine, including Alexander Vindman, the top Ukraine expert at the U.S. National Security Council, and Jennifer Williams, a current aide to Vice President Mike Pence. Katie Simpson tells us more about what they said. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Both have spent their careers serving their country. One, a decorated war hero, the other, a State Department veteran. And both today delivered scathing assessments of the July phone call between U.S. President Donald Trump and his Ukrainian counterpart. What I heard was inappropriate, and I reported my concerns to Mr. Eisenberg. It is improper for the President of the United States to demand a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen and a political opponent. I found the July 25th phone call unusual because in contrast to other presidential calls I had observed, it involved discussion of what appeared to be a domestic political matter. Without hesitation, I knew that I had to report this to the White House counsel. I had concerns and uh, it was my duty to report my concerns to the proper, uh, proper pe people in the chain of command. The Democrats argue that call is a flashpoint in Trump's alleged pressure campaign against Ukraine, where he and members of his administration urged the new president to launch an investigation into Joe Biden's son in exchange for financial aid and a meeting at the White House. The Republicans are absolutely killing it. They are doing so well because it's a, it's a scam. It's a big scam. Trump is dismissing the testimony, while Republicans try to undermine the credibility of the witnesses and force them to identify the whistleblower who started this whole affair. Uh, what agency was this individual from? If I could interject here, uh, we don't want to use these it's proceedings. Our, it's our time, I know, Mr. Chair. but we need to protect the whistleblower. Tomorrow's testimony is expected to be the most explosive of the week. Gordon Sondland, the U.S. ambassador to the EU, will speak to his role in all of this, which has so far been described as significant. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Donald Trump says he's watched only a bit of the impeachment hearing today, but he was highly critical of the way a top Democrat is handling another matter, the deal that's supposed to replace NAFTA. The U.S. president says Democratic House leader Nancy Pelosi isn't advancing the USMCA and that she's somehow using the deal to get impeachment votes. Pelosi can't get it off her desk. Just can't do it. The Democrats want to have it. The unions want it. The farmers want it. The manufacturers want it. I think the woman is grossly incompetent. 
Uh, and we're having a problem because Mexico and Canada are calling, saying, what's going on? Mexico has ratified the USMCA, but Canada and the U.S. have not. Police in Hong Kong have made over 1,000 arrests in the past 24 hours as the number of anti-government protesters holed up in a university dwindled. About 100 are believed to still be inside, some with serious injuries. Outside, this engineer was among dozens of supporters who turned up to pray for their safety. All of them are trapped inside uh, the university and many of them are trying to stay there. They're really willing to die for that. It's really hard breaking and we don't trust the police. Police say nearly 800 people who left the campus earlier would be investigated. Nearly 300 are said to be under the age of 18. This evening a few small groups tried to break out of out but returned when confronted by police. The whereabouts of Canadians believed to be among the demonstrators is not known. Global Affairs Canada will only say it is aware of Canadians affected and is in contact with local authorities. Police in Hong Kong say many detainees have been charged in connection with shooting arrows and hurling Molotov cocktails. Officials add 235 injured people were taken to hospital today. A fire in an historic building on Queen West sending a number of people into the streets early this morning. My wallet's in there, my money's in there, my, you know, manuscripts, I'm a composer, my man, all, everything's in my life is in there. The fire broke out around 5 a.m. The building dates back to the late 1800s. There's a restaurant on the ground floor and residential units above. Some of those people say they now have to figure out where to live. The fire chief was at the scene and talked about why it was so difficult to battle for fire crews. Fire extended into the walls and then was moving both laterally and vertically. So it's, uh, it's hard work to get to expose that fire and to get ahead of it and stop the forward spread of that fire. The cause is still under investigation. And a couple of hours before that fire, crews were called to a home in the Shepherd and 400 area. An 83-year-old man inside the home suffered burns and was taken to hospital in serious condition. Officials say the fire started in a room in the back of the home and they managed to stop it from spreading. A Toronto car dealership is warning others after a reckless theft left its salesman tra traumatized. The robbery involved a high-end vehicle, and as Kelda Ewan reports, the same suspect is believed to be responsible for a string of similar thefts across the GTA. He turned on the car, he locked the doors. A salesman waits by a Mercedes as a man looks inside, but then in a flash, he drives off. Right there, right there. See how, how, how dangerous that was? almost hitting a woman with a stroller. It happened at this dealership near Lawrence and Dufferin. Someone walked in, he asked to see that white GLE. We showed him the car, it was parked near the front and uh, he sat inside. Daniel Hassan's family owns the dealership. He says the salesman was holding the key. With these vehicles, you can start them even when the key is outside of the car. As long as you're nearby, you can have easy access to start the vehicle, even drive off. The vehicle, identical to this one, costing about $46,000. Nearly three months after it was stolen, it hasn't been recovered. Meanwhile, the salesman is now on stress leave. Uh, he was very frightened from, uh, uh, from this accident. Uh, could not go outside alone by himself uh, to show the vehicles to, the, uh, to any of my customers. Rima Shath is the general manager. What shocked me is uh, they got uh, no conscience at, at all. Uh, they had no regards to human life. Toronto police say they are still looking for the suspect, described as black, five foot seven, with a skinny build. This was just the first in a rash of thefts at high-end car dealerships. Later that same day, a suspect with a similar description and using the same tactic walked into a car dealership in Oakville and stole a Mercedes. And five days later, the same thing happened in Vaughan, this time leaving the owner of the dealership with serious injuries. He had attempted to stop the vehicle from fleeing by getting in front of it, jumping on the hood of it, um, but that vehicle did take off. And York Regional Police says they are still investigating and are working with other police forces given the similarities. Unfortunately, though, as for retrieving the vehicles, they say it's highly unlikely. The vehicle's removed from wherever it's taken from the property and very quickly loaded into a container, sealed up, and off it goes, never to be seen again. Back at this dealership, they are taking steps to stop thefts from happening again. Before we give him the access to the vehicle, 
is to get a background from him, like to get uh, information where he lives, a phone number. They are also trying to make it harder for thieves to get away by blocking the exits with vehicles. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. I'm Lorenda Redekop in Leslieville. It's a neighborhood with an important connection to black history and helping people escape slavery in the United States. That's now marked by this plaque. I'll also tell you about one woman who only found out a few months ago that she has a connection to that history. I'll have that story coming up. Looking at Lorenda and Leslieville, Leslieville there, Nick, where is all the snow? Where did it go, buddy? <laughs> yeah, I know. It melted, didn't it? Last uh, week at this time. Oh, tell me about it. Uh, you know, funny enough, like today actually felt relatively warm. That being said, we're still below the seasonal mark. Now, we briefly hit four degrees today. We're now sitting at three degrees. For the most part, we've hung around three degrees uh, throughout the day today. It has come with light winds, though, which has made it uh, kind of nice outside today. It has also come, though, with a fair deal of cloud cover. Now, that cloud cover is going to stick around for the next few days, but we'll see a few sunny breaks in there, especially heading into tomorrow. And in fact, through tonight, uh, you can kind of make this out on the satellite imagery. Pretty good um, wall of cloud cover there. However, uh, as this starts to break up a little bit through the night, I think we're going to see fog patches developing again, especially to the southwest of the uh, GTA areas like Kitchener, Waterloo, for example, uh, seeing fog and mist through the day today and certainly through the morning. That'll develop again as we head into tomorrow. What we're also watching, though, is the risk for a little bit in the way of icy road conditions that we still have the chance for some spotty freezing drizzle through tonight across the north end of the GTA and uh, into tomorrow uh, we'll see a little bit more in the way of sunshine now all that being said we're tracking rain for Thursday but for tomorrow by and large not a bad day pretty seasonal follows zero degrees tonight patchy fog as I mentioned tomorrow six degrees which puts us bang on the seasonal mark mix of sun and cloud by the afternoon and then some rain for Thursday full details on your forecast in just a bit thanks Nick you bet the city's Leslieville neighborhood has an important connection to black history and helping people escape slavery in the U.S. A new plaque along Queen Street marks that link to the Underground Railroad. Lorenda Redekop brings us the story of one woman who lives in Leslieville and only recently found out she has an ancestor who arrived here that way. Walk along Queen Street and you might miss it, but this new plaque has deep meaning with its connection to the Underground Railroad, giving black people from the United States a route to escape slavery. Thank you for giving me my history back. Thank you. Marnie Brunton only found out she had a direct link back in the summer. She met local historian Joanne Doucette through their dogs. Doucette started to research her family. Not easy since Brunton was adopted. Then she hit the jackpot, a picture of George Washington Milford, born in 1852. She found this picture of somebody that looked exactly like me. Like, I've never seen anybody that looked like me in my life. So she basically introduced me to my ancestors. So, Joanne, thank you. We know her roots are deep here, but whew, just digging. And I'm passionate about digging for the truth. Every small town has a four corners. Uh -huh. This is the four corners of the black community in Leslieville. Doucette gives walking tours of the area and wants its history remembered. So where the lights are at Eastern Avenue, that was Ashbridge's Bay where refugees from slavery cut ice. Probably the most miserable job in Leslieville. Brunton says she has a new connection to her neighborhood. It's amazing to know that the Underground Railway went through Ashbridge's Bay when that's that's where I live that's our stomping ground so it feels different there feels different you know in a predominantly you know white society that you know you absolutely belong here we all belong here she says for her it's just the start of searching for her family's story and its place in this neighborhood Lorenda Redekop CBC News Toronto and then I wrote on the filing cards what my idea was about the characters. So I knew everything about these characters. I knew what they had for breakfast. I knew about their family relations. I knew where they lived. I knew what sort of clothing they wore. And it was 200 pages and nothing had happened. I never used that system again. It was such a complete <laughs> screaming failure. Learning about the life and career of Margaret Atwood through a documentary called A Word After a Word After a Word is Power. 
I spoke to the filmmakers on what it was like putting our literary icon's life on the big screen. That conversation is coming up. The weather update is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Canadian literary giant Margaret Atwood celebrated her 80th birthday yesterday. Now you can get a rare look into her life and career. A new documentary called Margaret Atwood, A Word After a Word After a Word is Power, is now available on CBC Gem. And today I spoke to the filmmakers who followed the author around the world for the past year and a half. And I asked them what they discovered about Margaret Atwood behind the scenes. As someone uh, who's a writer of dystopian dark tales, uh, I was so surprised that her day-to-day -day life is full of levity, humor, and mischief. Yesterday was her 80th birthday, and yet she has so much energy. I thought that was surprising and uh, inspiring, really, as she's always on the go. She takes all these vitamin pills and minerals and stuff, but uh, <laughs> I think a lot of it is genetic, and she walks a lot, right? Ways, she keeps the mind an alive and, and active, scientist. and she's incredibly she's productive, like she writes any, everywhere on an airplane, in a taxi on the way to the airport, 
at home in the hotel room, wherever she is, she's always writing. She also captured some personal moments, and I don't feel like over the years we've seen a lot of the personal moments, not like the ones that you captured with her daughter and her grandson. What was that like, getting that kind of access to her and her family? Well, we were very thrilled that she gave us permission, that she and Graham gave us permission to follow them and, and intrude upon all their travels for a year and a half. But we're also very careful not to go too far. I mean, she was kind to give us the opportunity to, to travel with her, but we didn't want to um, interrupt her life. But she was very gracious. We, we didn't expect to have so many opportunities. She would suddenly offer, a, you know, a, oh, I'm going to see the gallery tomorrow at the Reich Museum. And we hadn't anticipated that, and we jumped at the opportunity to follow her. So even though we had limited time with her, she gave us extra opportunities on the travels. And whenever we were with her, she would come over to us and we'd pin on the radio mic and she would, you know, be happy to wear it. And so we could, you know, you can pick up the, the intimate conversations that she's having with people. She was uh, really welcoming and terrific to, to be with. And we were really delighted to see her interact with her readers and fans. That yes, was that, that was very interesting. It was a nice one with her grandson too at the dancing. That was very special. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you also, follow her partner with her, Graham, who is a great Canadian writer in his own right, yeah. but we lost him this year. What was that like following him and towards the end there and, and her sharing those moments? Well, he was very gracious to us at all times, always with a smile and greeted us. And he was very brave just to continue going, even though he had his dementia and Margaret, you know, they traveled together everywhere and, and uh, it was lovely that he stayed on and even he was there for the uh, launch of the Testaments in London. You know, it was, uh, the, the film really is a love story. That's the, the light motif, the underlying theme of the film is Margaret and Graham's love story and, and you see them when they first met, he talks about yes. looking through the camera <laughs> and seeing this beautiful woman and, and we see those pictures uh, yeah, and, yeah. and we have his photos from that moment yeah. there's a lovely cbc radio interview thanks to the cbc for keeping all these old things where graham interviews margaret this is before they were a couple and you can sort of sense the electricity between them so that that was that was wonderful to watch the two of them together what do you hope that viewers and and listeners take away from this documentary your work on margaret atwood uh a sense of pride in, 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 in her and her work. That works, because uh, that's what I felt watching it, yeah. <laughs> a better understanding of the things that she and Graham care about, and that is the environment. And, and, a lot and, of uh, issues affecting our planet right now. Yeah, and the and birds especially, yes. they're, they're big, big supporters of birds and protection of their habitats. So that's something. And the oceans. And yeah. the oceans. I mean, there was a great line in there that said, when we lose the birds, it's like, we could be next. Like, that. that's also, she talks about that in the film. Right. And at the very end of the film, we included a, a response of Margaret's to a question from a young 18-year-old who said, what's your advice? And she said, there's three things you have to do. You should vote, subscribe to a newspaper, and know the truth. So important. I think that's a perfect way to end this. Thank you. Go watch the doc. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks no, thank lot. you for this. I'm a gamer, so I'm passionate about my gaming community and I wanted to do something um, to better that experience for everyone else um, in the community. Meet the CEO of Beam, a multi-million dollar esports company. We'll bring you her journey coming up a little later in the show.
Students at U of T have been sounding the alarm over what they call a mental health crisis. There have been four suicides on campus in the last year and a half. Tonight on the National, Joanna Romiliotis looks at the struggles many students face at the University of Toronto. We will speak with Joanna in a minute, but first, here's an excerpt from tonight's story. Shaheen Imtiaz has battled depression since her early years as a computer science major. She says it's her duty to speak up for those who can't, including the ones who died here in her department's building. After the third suicide here, the university installed barriers in exposed areas, a move it says it regrets not doing sooner. In the lobby, silent reprimands and urgent demands. I owe it to you know, as someone who's still around and who's kind of seen the very real human cost of you know, this negligence to do something about it. It concerns me, it worries me, it keeps me up at night, it affects me quite personally. Sandy Welsh is the university's vice provost and oversees the health and wellness centers that run most counseling services. Mental health and the ability of our students um, to thrive on our campus, that's a priority. After the recent spike in suicides, the university spent an extra $3 million to boost counseling services overall and is trying to see urgent cases more quickly. Someone is talking to them in that initial moment who's able to counsel them, who's able to provide them with support, and able also, it's, it's important to get the, um, to understand what it is that the student is, is experiencing so we can help determine the kind of care that we need to be providing and the counseling we need to be providing going forward. And Joanna joins us now. We've heard a lot about U of T here, but tell us about what's happening in universities right across the country. Well, we had that same question, Dwight, and we put out a series of questions to universities across the country, 30 in all. And we asked them questions like, how many students are on wait lists? How long are they waiting? What are your policies in terms of providing more support? And U of T, for example, did not tell us how many students are waiting for counseling. So that's a sticky issue with the activists for sure. But many universities didn't divulge that either. Some, though, like McGill, for example, would spell out what they are doing to support students and make it easier to access the help once they need it. And that included creating a wellness hub that helps deal with the whole issue of navigating when you are in distress. So students there at McGill, for example, only go to one place to get the help that they need. Yeah, it seems like one-stop shopping it's better for something like this because the kids don't have to try to travel around and figure this out themselves. Let's bring it back to UFT. Some students and advocates are blaming some of the issues there on a controversial program that they say actually discouraging students from getting help it actually discourages them yeah like one of the big things that we encountered at all the rallies that we attended was of course wait lists are a huge issue and that's something that is top of mind but there's also something else that's going on here at U of T and it's called the mandatory leave policy and in our survey we found maybe a handful of the universities had something similar and what that policy does is it allows the university to remove a student from school if they are deemed a threat to themselves or to others and the student the university says it's an act of compassion it gives students a chance to take a break take a break from their studies and get better and then come back and you know there's no academic penalty for that break but it is an enforced break and many students perceive it as punitive and something that alienates them so we spoke to some students who are in need of help who have been diagnosed with anxiety and depression but won't go for help because they're afraid that if they do they might be asked to leave so the university does acknowledge that this is a problem they do have a perception problem and they're working on it Dwight they're saying they're trying to develop an awareness campaign so that the language is clear that once you do come for help that you're not necessarily going to be asked to leave that it's a process that they're going to examine every other recourse before they get to that point a lot of layers to this one very complicated looking forward to your piece thank you Joanna Welcome. tonight you can watch Joanna's full doc on the national that's at 9 o'clock on CBC News Network 10 p.m. right here on CBC television and of course streaming on the CBC gem Appeal police officer accused of making xenophobic comments is now facing an internal disciplinary process. Last November, Constable Bernard Chulea arrested a food delivery worker seen in the bottom right here after an alleged dispute at a restaurant. He took the man's phone and accidentally recorded their conversation inside his cruiser. We've had dealings with you so many times that I said, forget it. This kid obviously doesn't understand the, the rule and nature and the culture of Canada. Okay, he wants to be violent and bring that violence with him, then he's going to have to learn the way. 
A police Washock found the officer engaged in serious misconduct during the unlawful arrest. The victim's father says the family is still waiting for a response. All what I need is a simple apology. Just an apology from peer police to what their officer did. What they do with their own officer, I, I really leave it to them. Julia has not yet entered a plea. The hearing continues in January. This is for the kids, uh, community, and then and as importantly, the city. This is a city who's on the upswing. This Oshawa man is trying to convert a city-owned storage space into a center for young athletes, but he's hitting roadblocks with groups blocking all of his shots. We'll tell you why coming up. Okay, you might need sunglasses for this next one. It may be the most blink-covered tree you will ever see. It's literally lovely. The lights are amazing. And for Christmas, it's the best thing you really want to see. I can stay here all day long and stare it. Okay, there it is. It took days to drape this festive-looking tree with thousands of tiny Swarovski crystals. The sparkling baubles cost $150,000. But many in this picturesque city think it's worth it. The park is famous for its elaborate gardens, and the one-of-a-kind tree fits right in. That time of year, so I gotta get those baubles for the Christmas tree. I know. You know what? Last Monday when we had that snowfall, mm -hmm. I was a little confused. I think, are we in December yet? <laughs> <laughs> Bit early, even for me, and I like the snow. But anyway, uh, we've sort of come out of that. Temperatures above uh, above the zero mark, uh, but it's still below seasonal today. Now that is changing. We've got a return to seasonal uh, for tomorrow. Next couple of days uh, and then mostly cloudy skies though on the way and we've got a few showers to talk about that's uh, going to be for Thursday uh, let's put things in perspective here the average daytime high 6.2 degrees for today the average low minus 1.2 uh, you've got your record snowfalls there as well and record uh, highs and lows but really it's the averages I'm focusing on here we hit four degrees briefly today three right now so it is below seasonal but that is changing heading into tomorrow we've got temperatures starting to climb uh, still dealing with cloud cover out there today now we've we will see a little bit in the way of uh, breaks in this cloud cover through tonight but what that'll actually do is help us to develop fog and mist once again especially to the southwest of the GTA. So watch for that as we move in through uh, tomorrow morning as well. And the other thing to watch is just north of the GTA. We could see some patchy uh, freezing drizzle. Uh, not a lot to speak of. However, with temperatures hovering around zero or minus one tonight, could make for some icy roads, especially on the commute in from north of the GTA. For the city itself, we should stay at or above zero degrees. And I, I don't think we're going to be dealing with that uh, for the morning commute. Now, into tomorrow afternoon, looks like we are going to see some of the cloud cover break up so I think we will see some sunshine through tomorrow afternoon not a whole lot we'll see a little bit and then into Thursday Thursday morning uh, again some sunny breaks but we're watching this system now it looks like a lot of rain on here but really it's only going to be about two to five millimeters of rain at least that's what we're looking at at this point and that'll last from about uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon on Thursday through uh, Thursday uh, evenings commute Forecast wise for tonight, uh, temperatures down around zero to minus one. Again, fog patches developing in some areas for the GTA, just mainly cloudy skies. And watch for some patchy uh, ice or freezing drizzle, especially to the north of the GTA for tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon, uh, clearing the mix of sun and cloud, highs to about six degrees. That puts us bang on seasonal for this time of year. And uh, as we look into the long range forecast, it does stick around for Thursday and then things start to drop. In fact, Thursday, uh, Thursday night's low of 4 degrees will be Friday's daytime high. That'll come in the morning and then temperatures will drop on Friday. Weekend doesn't look too bad, albeit below seasonal, but a mix of sun and cloud for both days. Dwight. Thanks, Nick. Bye. Thousands of sea and rail workers have walked off the job. The strike comes after months of negotiating with little progress. Workers claim their health and safety is at risk. The company says job cuts are necessary as business is down. Uh, the strike is still young. Uh, the company still has plenty of time to change their attitude at the bargaining table. The safety issues and the uh, issues relating to the health of our members that we've raised at the bargaining table have fallen on deaf ears. And these are issues that absolutely need to be resolved. The strike began at midnight last night. The industry was quick to react with mining companies predicting dire consequences and job losses if the strike goes on. Oil producers also warned that they rely on CNRL to get their products to market. And for farmers, the strike comes during a, light, a late rather harvest season. 
The federal labor minister says she's monitoring talks and is hopeful the two sides will soon reach a deal. And as we head to break, here's a look at where the markets closed today. The TSX was down by over 13 points. The Dow Jones was also down by 102. And the Canadian dollar traded for an average of 75 cents U.S. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Call it Storage Wars, the Oshawa edition. A local businessman is trying to convert a city-owned storage facility into a not-for-profit training center for young athletes. It's above a hockey rink in a local arena and houses dozens of caged lockers. But the proposal is facing pushback from community groups. Farah Morelli explains why. So this is a uh, storage locker um, unit for all the associations. Uh, Welcome to the second floor of Dell Park Home Center. It's a series of caged yes. lockers, <clears throat> housing everything from trophies it to equipment. But Kirk Lowe sees something else. I envision having uh, equipment over here where they can do functional fitness, so rubber mats the whole way, and this part over here being all a grass turf where they can run. Believe Lowe wants to take advantage of these tall ceilings and the 5,500 square feet to build a place where young athletes can train. There's a lot of hockey teams and ball hockey here, so they could have some sports specific training over there so they could practice their shooting, passing. Yeah, He's mapped it all out, yeah, even fundraised $250,000. But there's a hitch. We've been using those facilities for, uh, for I think probably since the beginning, which is probably about 15 years. The city owned space is currently rented out to seniors and not for profit associations. When you think about the fact that there are, I don't know, 30 groups, not for profits, uh, small little organizations that have a, a place with reasonable rent to store their equipment or whatever uh, and the fact that they're going to lose that, uh, that's a shame. Well, the proposal came to us and uh, I'm very positive about it. Lowe's project has the support of this city councillor, but yeah, the city there. can't guarantee where exactly the groups could move their items or at what cost. But I don't think they've actually zeroed in on where particular facilities are underused and storage space could be available. Last week a joint committee heard depositions from Lowe and others. A survey found the vast majority of tenants of the storage spaces don't want to move. So the committee voted not to recommend Lowe's project to the city. But the final decision rests in the hands of council, which is expected to make a decision on Lowe's proposal early next month. 
There's a lot of good that can happen. And, and with that, Lowe is still holding out hope that these cages can come down and make way for us bigger dreams. Farah Morali, CBC News, Oshawa. Despite strides to increase women's representation in Canadian workplaces, women still hold less than one-fifth of leadership roles, according to Stats Canada. Today, the world celebrates Women's Entrepreneurship Day, and one Toronto woman is sharing her success story. She's 30 years old and is the CEO of a multi-million dollar esports platform, Beam. I got involved into esports really by volunteering, uh, building communities and attending events myself, organizing events myself, and just overall being interested and passionate about the industry. I'm a gamer, so I'm passionate about my gaming community and I wanted to do something um, to better that experience for everyone else um, in the community. Being a female CEO in the esports industry is definitely challenging. There's a lot of different types of uh, obstacles that you have to overcome and overall just, you know, having that confidence to, you know, speak up and not be discouraged if someone that you met is telling you that uh, what you're doing is wrong. If you're passionate, if you have grit, and if you're resilient, then you will find success in the idea that you're building upon. There's a lot of history that goes into sort of standing right here. A storybook success. Ian Williams takes home Canada's top literary award, the Scotiabank Giller Prize, for his debut novel, Reproduction. We'll have all the details of this Brampton Kids win after the break. And the winner of the 2019 Scotiabank Giller Prize is... Ian Williams for his novel, Reproduction. Reproduction. The big winner of the Scotiabank Giller Prize is, as you heard there, Ian Williams with his novel, Reproduction. For a debut novelist, it's obviously the thrill of a lifetime. The award comes with a cash prize of 100,000 bucks. While each of the other five shortlisted finalists take home 10,000. Mm -hmm. Yana was on the red carpet for us last night. Yep. And um, a bit of foreshadowing happened <laughs> because the person that you interviewed on the show last night 
ended up being a winner. He's a Brampton kid. Shout out to Brampton, yeah. producing some great literary icons here. Ian. Williams. Man, this was such a fun night for so many people who were there because this is a man who is just so genuinely happy to win. Uh -uh. So his family immigrated to Canada from Trinidad in the late 80s, right? He grew up in Brampton. Shout out to the Trinity. That's yes. right. He gets his <laughs> master's at U of T. And it's interesting because although he's now based in Vancouver, he's an assistant professor of poetry at UBC, mm -hmm. he decided to set the story of his novel in a Toronto suburb. Namely Brampton. All right, so let me give you a look at the cover. And uh, we talk a little bit about reproduction. The story, it spans 40 years. It explores a very fragile family ties. It's interesting because it starts out in Brampton in the 70s. And there's this unlikely romance, right? So we see a young woman. She's from an unnamed Caribbean island and mm -hmm. a much older, much wealthier man of German descent. Now, eventually, they have a son together. And we kind of travel through time so that eventually the story ends up being a lot about the mother and the son as a teenager. But what's really wild about it is how he weaves people from the past back into the story and makes up all these connections. So it's about family, it's about love, it's also about consent, and it has to do with issues of immigration, and it's just really, really powerful. So let's take a look now at what the jury ended up saying, because this was a statement about the book that it's a masterful unfolding of unexpected connections and collusions between and across lives otherwise separated by race, class, gender, and geography. That's collisions, not collusions there. And uh, yeah, so it was obviously something that moved them. Now, as we talk about geography there, Dwight, why don't I go all the way back to the fact of Brampton and how he put this into his speech and also uh, when we interviewed him after he won, Deanna Sumanak, my colleague, did that one. Dwight, I'm going to need you to get me a tissue and oh, I'm going to let you guys watch. All right. Okay. You don't write books for this moment here and then it happens and you're totally off guard as a human. Incredibly special and all of your history just kind of like rushes back to you. And I imagine myself as a boy in Brampton and I imagine myself as a boy in Trudad. And just like, yeah, there's a lot of history that goes into sort of standing right here. Isn't that just so sweet and special? Oh, yeah, so you yeah. were able to also talk to Margaret Atwood on the red carpet. Yeah, it was yeah. her 80th birthday, I know. by the way. But there was also a special moment involving her, and I'm guessing this young man, because I think I know the moment you're going to play. Yeah, okay, so it was really interesting because she was there, but we didn't really expect her to be there because she wasn't on the short list, right? She was on the long list with her book Testaments, which is, of course, the sequel to Handmaid's Tale. And I already want to book her, but anyway. Yeah, she, she's doing fine, <laughs> but it was great. You know, she shows up to support, and then there's this moment where, when, you know, he wins, and he gets up on stage, yes. and he gives this shout-out. Have a look. Margaret Atwood over there. It's the first book I bought with my own money at a bookstore in Brampton. And I bought that book because I had good public school teachers, like Mr. Lusick and Mrs. Colton, who pushed poetry on us, and this was my way. I love hearing props right? to teachers. Come on now. It's the best, right? So, you know, it's interesting because uh, Atwood actually did win back in the 90s for Alias Grace. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Atwood's on the list, Alice Monroe, Michael Andache, Ian Williams is in very good company. He really is. Oh, yay. Congrats for that. Congratulations. Young man. Can't wait to read that one. That's a good one. Thank you, Eleanor. See you soon. It felt a bit more like fall today, and it is still fall, folks. Will tomorrow be the same? We'll check in with Nick after the break. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Our arson grad is helping to keep all feet warm this winter. There's a lot of homeless people in this area specifically, and I was trying to sort of rack my brains of ways to creatively um, make a difference. And so the idea of the vending machine came about. And it's a good idea when you buy a pair of novelty socks at this vending machine, a second pair comes out for you to donate. Those behind the project say new socks are some of the most needed but least donated items at homeless shelters. Customers can donate their socks at a bin right beside the machine, or if they want, they can personally deliver them. Obviously, homelessness is not going to go away, but if we can make their day a little bit brighter by, you know, just chatting with them, maybe leaving them with something behind, I think that's what we can do. The project has partnered with Canadian charity Socks for Souls. They will be delivering the socks throughout the GTA. The Ryerson vending machine is the first in our city, but if it is successful, they hope to expand to other schools as well as hospitals and airports. Good idea coming from Pretty those cool, kids eh? at Ryerson, and I'm not just saying that because I went to Ryerson. <laughs> All right, what do we have for tomorrow? I, well, tomorrow, uh, you don't need to have those thick wool socks. No. But Last week, we certainly did. I like that six. Man. Yeah, we'll seasonal. I know. Finally, back up to seasonal. That's actually where we should be for this time of year. Six degrees. Uh, that follows zero for tonight. Watch for uh, patchy fog. We saw that earlier this morning mm -hmm. as well. Kind of reduced visibilities and some icy roads to the north of the GTA. Otherwise, looking pretty good for tomorrow. Six degrees and then a uh, little bit of rain. Better than snow, though. Yes, sir. I'll tell you, Monday just took me by a shock as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be on top of this stuff, but I was off for You're a little while. You're supposed to know it's coming, yeah, buddy. Yeah, yeah. And then Saturday, I go, what? Snow no. Anyway, that is it for our show tonight. Thank you for watching. Mike Wise has you covered on The Late Show tonight at 11. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night, everybody.